the second lesson on the costs of production faced by firms in the short run and how the law of diminishing marginal returns helps understand the costs that firms face as they produce more and more output or as they reduce their output of goods and services in the short run. To illustrate the law of diminishing marginal returns in my classes, I have for several years now engaged in a simulation which I call the paper chain factory. Now the basic rules of this simulation are as follows. I set up a factory in my classroom which consists of two desks pushed together, some capital resources consisting of two pairs of scissors and two tape dispensers, and I use my students as labor. With labor, capital, and land, we produce paper chains. Now, to start the simulation, only one student works in the factory and produces the longest paper chain possible. After one minute, I record the length of that chain in a table, which I'll show you momentarily. In the next round, I add a second worker and record the total output as measured by the length of the chain at the end of another minute. This goes on for eight rounds. I add one student at each round until there are a total of eight students working in the paper chain factory. At the end of each one minute round, I measure the length of the chain that they produced and record that in a table. I'll show you what it looked like in my class this week when we conducted this simulation. As you can see, at this point in the simulation, there are already eight students in my paper chain factory. However, there are only two pairs of scissors and two tape dispensers being used to make paper chains. Not every student has capital at their disposal, yet every student has been told that they must participate in the manufacturing of the paper chains. So what we're doing is, as they produce these chains, I am recording and take keeping track of the length of the chain that they ultimately produce. By the end of the one minute round, we'll record the length of the chain in our table and we'll use that data to analyze the productivity of the workers in this paper chain factory. Here you can see we're counting down to the end of the one minute round, at which time I will determine how long of a chain they have manufactured. The time is up, time to measure the length of the chain and record the data in our table. Now, when conducting this simulation, it's important to have a data table prepared so that you can record the output of your workers at the end of each one minute round. So this is what the table looks like when I do this simulation. The first thing we record is the quantity of workers. In my class, we went up to eight workers. So I'm gonna put the numbers one through eight in the left column of our table. The next piece of information we record throughout the simulation is the total product or the output at the end of each round after which one additional worker has been added to the paper chain factory. I'm going to fill in the data that we found when we conducted this experiment in my class this week. In the case of my class, the total product or the length of the chain got longer and longer until we hired our sixth worker. Beyond the sixth worker, the total product actually began to decline, indicating that with eight workers in my factory, the total output was actually less than when I had only five or six workers in my factory. So the next column tells us the marginal product, which is the change in total product as a result of the addition of one more worker. So, the, so what we're going to simply measure is the change in total product each time we added an additional worker. So our first worker, of course without any workers the output would have been zero. So when we added one worker the change in the total product was from zero to two, meaning the marginal product is two. The second worker's marginal product was three, the third worker's was four, and so on. I'll fill in the rest of this column now. Here we see the marginal product of labor. In other words, the output resulting from the addition of one more worker in each round of this simulation. Next, we're going to calculate the average product. This is very simple. It's simply the output divided by the number of workers, or the total product divided by the quantity of labor. So for this one, all we'll do is we'll take the second column and divide it by the first column at each stage of our simulation. So at the end of round one, we had one worker producing two units. Therefore, the average product was 2 divided by 1. At the end of round 2, two workers had made 5 units, giving us an average product of 2.5. I'll go ahead and fill in the rest of this column now. Here we have the average product at each quantity of labor. 
So we've just taken the total product and divided it by the number of workers to find out the output per worker. That's what average product tells us. So now our table is complete. On our left, we have the number of workers. And in each successive column, we've recorded the total product or the output at the end of each one minute round, the marginal product, which is the change in total product resulting from the additional worker that was added. And finally, the average product, which is just the output per worker. Next, we're going to plot these variables on a graph. So the graph on the right here, we see that the quantity of labor is on the x-axis from one worker to eight workers. Of course, we have the origin here at which there were zero workers. And the total product, the origin, will naturally be zero. So we can start with the point right here at zero. On the vertical axis, we're actually measuring the output or the productivity of labor. So let's go ahead and plot the total product first. We're going to go down our column here. And at each quantity of labor, we're going to record the output resulting from that many workers. So we have a point at one worker and two links. We have a point at two workers and five links. And I'll continue drawing this curve by plotting each of the points from the first column on the left. Here you can see I've plotted each of the levels of output as additional workers were added to our paper chain factory. All I have to do is connect these dots and what I will have is the total product curve. It's easy to see from this graph how total product changes as output changes. Beyond a certain point, it's obvious that the output ultimately decreases as more and more workers were added to our paper chain factory. Next, let's plot the marginal product. Let's start by looking at the marginal product of the first worker. As you can see, the marginal product at one worker is equal to the total product since the first worker produces two units that is also the marginal product. We'll go along and plot the marginal product of labor as more and more workers are added. Here we've plotted the different points for the marginal product of labor. As you can see the marginal product actually becomes negative because beyond six workers the output attributable to the additional workers is less than zero, indicating that the productivity of labor has become negative. If we connect these dots, we'll have the marginal product curve for labor in our paper chain factory. We can label this curve marginal product. Finally, let's plot the average product. This is going to be a little bit trickier since we have so many decimals, but I'll do my best to plot the average product or the output per worker at each level of employment in this factory. Now we've got all the dots representing the average product at each level of employment here. As we connect these dots, we will see the firm's average product curve. Notice that at first average product increases until it intersects the marginal product curve and then average product begins to decrease. Now we've got our three productivity curves for labor in our paper chain factory. It's time to make some observations about these curves and bring in the concept of the law of diminishing returns, which will help us better understand the shapes of these curves. First, let's look at the total product curve. Notice that as employment in our factory increases, total product increases. Now, what explains the shape of the total product curve? We can actually make a couple of simple observations here about the relationship between another curve on this graph and the total product curve. Notice, for example, that as long as marginal product is increasing, in other words, between one and three workers, the total product curve seems to get steeper and steeper. So as we can see, when marginal product is increasing, total product is increasing, but also it's increasing at an increasing rate. In other words, the slope is getting greater and greater because the marginal product is actually the slope of the total product curve. So at any point along our total product curve, the slope at that point is the marginal product. The marginal product measures the change in total product divided by the change in the quantity of workers. For this reason, we should assume that when marginal product begins decreasing, in other words, beyond three workers, in this range of the marginal product curve, the slope of total product should begin decreasing. And sure enough, that's visible here. Beyond three workers, the total product curve continues to increase. It's still sloping upwards, but the slope is getting flatter and flatter, indicating that the change in total product is becoming less and less as output increases. Ultimately, beyond six workers, the total product begins decreasing. Now this occurs at the point 
at which marginal product becomes negative. Because recall, marginal product is the slope of total product. It is the change in total product resulting from one more worker. When the marginal product becomes negative, total product begins sloping downwards. Total product begins decreasing. This is certainly not an optimal level of employment in our paper chain factory. If I were the owner of this factory, I would never want to hire seven workers because the output attributable to that seventh worker is negative and my firm's total output actually falls. So there's some relationships between marginal product and total product. Let's summarize these now. First of all, if marginal product is increasing, total product is increasing at an increasing rate. We'll make that our first point. Our second point, our second observation, is that if marginal product is negative, total product is decreasing. This is explained, of course, by the fact that marginal product is the change in total product. If an additional worker's marginal product is negative, this means that the total output of our factory has actually fallen. Next, let's observe the relationships between marginal product and average product. To do this, I'm going to draw a new graph in which I isolate the marginal and average product curve so that we can observe this relationship more clearly. Here we've isolated the marginal product and the average product curves. So some basic observations about the marginal product curve, first of all. First, let's observe what happens between one and three workers. As we added those first three workers to our two pairs of scissors and two tape dispensers and two desks pushed together, we actually saw increasing marginal returns. Now, increasing marginal returns occurred because the existing capital in our paper chain factory began being used more and more efficiently as we hired more workers to work in that factory. Beyond that, however, we experienced diminishing marginal returns. So along the length of the marginal product curve over which marginal product is declining, diminishing marginal returns occurred. This was explained in a previous video lesson. What we wish to focus on now, however, is the relationship between marginal product and average product. Let's make a simple observation here. What we can notice is that the average product curve reaches its highest point when marginal product equals average product. So one observation we can make is that average product is maximized when marginal product crosses the average product curve. That means that at any point at which marginal product is greater than average product, the average product is increasing. For example, between one and four workers along this range of our average product curve, marginal product is greater than average product, so average product is increasing. What's the explanation for this? Well, let's remember what these two things measure. Marginal product is the change in total product attributable to the last worker hired. Basically, as long as the last worker I hired produces more than the average output of all the workers already in my factory, that average will be pulled up. You can imagine marginal product is like a magnet. Our marginal product is like a magnet pulling average product up with it. As long as marginal product is greater than average product, average product will be pulled up. Now what if marginal product becomes less than average product? Well, just like a magnet, it would pull the average product down. So if marginal product is less than average product, average product will be pulled down. If the output that the last worker produced was less than what the average worker was producing, then average product will begin decreasing as we see here. So anytime marginal product is less than average product, average is decreasing. However, if marginal product is greater than average product, average is increasing. One example I use in my own classes to help explain this is to have students think about their test scores in a particular class. If a student is averaging 80 percent on tests and on the last test they earned a 90 percent, what would happen to their average test score? Students know right away that their average would be pulled up 
by the higher score on your last test. On the other hand, if you were averaging 80% and on your last test you got a 70%, your average would be pulled down. This logic is very straightforward. If the additional worker produces more than the average worker, then the average output of the workers will increase. However, if the last worker produced less than the average worker, then the average will decrease. So now we have illustrated all the different relationships between the average marginal and total product curves in a firm as it hires more workers in the short run in order to increase its output of a particular good. In our paper chain factory, we were producing paper chains and the output was measured by the number of links in the paper chain. As I hired more workers, as we see here, from one worker to eight workers, total product increased at first due to the fact that marginal product was positive. From one to six workers, total product was increasing. But beyond six workers, total product was decreasing. And as you see, the relationship between total product and marginal product is that any time total product is increasing, this means marginal product is positive. So the range over which total product increases also happens to be when marginal product is positive. When the marginal product of labor becomes negative, however, total product decreases due to the fact that additional workers are actually subtracting from the final output of the firm. Now the final relationship we observe today is that between marginal product and average product. There is a range of employment over which marginal product is greater than average product. That in this exercise was between one and three workers. Here marginal product was greater than average product and therefore average product was increasing. Beyond the fourth worker, however, the marginal product became less than the average product and predictably the average product decreased as a result. So this lesson illustrated all the different relationships between the productivity of labor as measured by total, marginal, and average product in the short run as firms employ more workers towards the production of, in this case, paper chains. Now this relationship should hold up in any sort of factory situation in which there is a fixed amount of capital and land and a variable amount of labor. The law of diminishing marginal returns underlies the shapes of all of these curves and explains how a firm's output will change in the short run as it varies the level of output by varying the amount of labor employed.